Hey everybody, welcome to Bones Collector. That's right, I'm going to talk about Mercator. And uh, why am I talking about a nine-year-old game? Well, because it took me all this time to find a copy. And, uh, I've been looking for it for years. I could not come up with a copy uh, at conventions or wherever I, you know, flea markets or uh, sidewalk sales for board game stores, and I just never uh, could come up with a copy of this game. It was really frustrating, but I just kept my eyes open and. And uh, I never did come up with one, but I found a, a way to buy a new one off the internet. So I paid handsomely, I guess, is what I'm trying to tell you. Uh, usually I'm bragging about uh, the, the, the prices that I pay for games that I find at flea markets or, or uh, conventions. But this one I had to pay uh, a lot of money for and because uh, I was after it. I mean, let's face it, if it's, I knew it was a good game. I watched it played and, and uh, knew I was going to like it. So I stayed in the hunt for it. And um, just one day I decided, hey, what the heck, I'm buying this game. So I sent away for it. It arrived about uh, three weeks ago, and, and I finally got around to playing it. And um, i got to tell you this. It's, uh, Mercator came out in 2010. It's designed by Uwe Rosenberg, and uh, it's, it's a freak of nature. This game is amazing, and uh, it's one of Uwe's best. Um, if you if you uh, are f familiar with gaming board games, uh, you know Uwe Rosenberg. Uh, uh, he have Agricola and Glass Road and Fields of Arla and Lahav and Ora Labora and Caverna and uh, Feast for Odin. He's designed some amazing games, and this is right up there with the best of them. And uh, I've seen on the internet a lot of people criticizing this game, and and uh, because it's I don't know. They, for some reason, they say it's boring, and I, I don't get that feel from it as far as thematic ties in the game and, and what the game is doing. But uh, the theme is this. Uh, during the 30 year war, 30 years war in Europe, it was in 1618 to 1648, all of Europe was at war. And uh, Hamburg, the city of Hamburg, was the center of commerce. And uh, it's where everybody would go with their goods to trade and uh, uh, you know produce uh, other things they would and the Hamburg served all warring nations they didn't care who you were you know you could go there and and uh, buy your your wool or your cotton and uh, copper or whatever you were looking for you could go there and trade uh, without uh, any kind of problem so uh, that's what this game is about and it has a two-piece board here and there's 12 countries or 12 locations on there and uh, you simply are going to travel around these countries gathering resources to fulfill contracts to get bigger contracts and better contracts and at the when someone finally gets a number 10 contract that triggers the end of the game and another end game trigger is pretty interesting time is also a resource because you're traveling around the world it costs you in time, just like it would in real, in you know, a, a real-world simulation. That's what this is. So if you travel from Hamburg to Newfoundland, it's going to cost you three of these time tokens to go there, because it's a long way away. So you have to have those in your reserve. You can't go there. If you have a contract for Newfoundland and you need to go there to fulfill it, if you don't have the time to go there, you can't go, and you can't fulfill that contract. So it's just going to sit there. But um, that's the theme of this game, is, to, uh, is uh, all of these countries that people would come to Hamburg to uh, uh, do their trading, get extra goods, take back to um, their nations, and that's the meat of, or the story of this game. So one of the cool things about this game, of course, are these little bins, and they sit in cutouts in the, pl in the board. And uh, so you punch those out and these little bins you put together and they hold the resources. Every color of cube is stands for two resources. I, I think this is grain and salt Peter for instance and this is calf skin and vegetables and this is wine and plums. The blue is wine and plums and red is spice and citrus fruit. But uh, you get the picture. It's, it's just a lot of different resources and you have an office or player board that you're going to st store them on and it has a place for each one of them. Once you acquire them, you want to put them there for storage. And, uh, and then once you have the resources you need and you have a contract down here on your board that you can fulfill with the resources there, you go to that location on the board and uh, you can fulfill that contract. But that's the rule set is very simple. I mean, it's very, you know, this rule book, is, there's hardly anything to it. It's a pretty easy game to learn. 
But I tell you, the puzzle itself, the puzzle is so intricate and so um, interwoven. The mechanics work beautifully together, and I think that's what frustrates a lot of people. This game, uh, the puzzle of this game, is cerebral. So if you do not like to think hard uh, in board gaming, you're going to hate this. And it's, there's people that just don't like to play those kinds of games, and that's fine. Um, you know, if you don't like this kind of thing, don't, you know, stay away from it. But it, you still shouldn't be critical of it because the game design is fantastic. He did a great job with this, Uwe Rosenberg, and uh, I find it entertaining and extremely fun because uh, um, Laura and I like to think hard once in a while when we're playing board games. Other board games, you know, I mean, sometimes you don't want to think hard and you, you get some games that are a little easier. And we have a lot of those too. We have, uh, you know, both styles of games that we like enjoy to play. But hey, so, sometimes we like to work hard intellectually. And this game will do that, put you through your paces. And, uh, and it's a beautiful thing. And I just wanted to tell you about it because um, it's very difficult to come by this game, and uh, I, next year will uh, will be the tenth year. Maybe uh, Lookout Games or somebody will uh, they'll do a ten year printing of this game. And if you like games, uh, board games that put you through your paces, you're going to love this game. Again, the rules are easy. It's very self-explanatory. Once you set it up and you read through the rules, you're like, oh, okay, nothing to it but putting together and doing your best, or weaving that tapestry so that you can optimize your point scoring and do the best you can this game, it's a very complex puzzle, folks, and that is what Mercator is, and I really, really love that. Um, whenever you travel around this board, it costs you some of these time tokens off this time board. Once that time board, the last time token has been taken off of there, that's also an endgame trigger. I just wanted to mention that. So there's two endgame triggers. When someone gets a uh, number 10 contract and when the time tokens come off the board and um, that's it when when that happens then you add up your points of the contracts that you have on your board uh, the building cards and I'll talk about those in a minute uh, there's three types of cards in this game there's bonus cards that give you extra extra resources of some kind when you go to a location for instance this is uh, this card says Bohemia when I go to Bohemia I get plus two fabric and um, when I go to Russia, I get plus two spice. So you, you can purchase these, and, uh, and they help you get more resources to fulfill those contracts faster. So you got bonus cards, you got building cards that give, give you end game scoring bonuses. So you have, and four of those are visible at all times. When you see one that you want to purchase, you need to do that. For instance, this one says five points if you're the sole player with the most bonus cards, which are the ones I just showed you. So if you think, if you're looking at the, uh, the other players on the t at the table and uh, you're going to have the most bonus cards, this card comes up, you want to buy that card for six bucks because it gives you five points. And the scoring is tight in this game. So, uh, I mean, you're, uh, these games are going to be, um, you're going to be within ten points always when you play this game. Uh, generally within five points of each other because that's just the way a beautiful board game works. You know, games that have great designs, when the players play them, the finish is tight and uh, it's a photo finish usually and that's the way this game uh, played for us and um, yeah it was a beautiful thing but you've got bonus cards end game building cards and contracts that's all the cards there are in this game your resources the board that is the whole world in for Europe and traveling around that board spending the time necessary to go from location to location the close locations you know if you go to a close location you gain some time if you go to a far away place you gotta pay some time so it works very well thematically I love this game it's amazing one thing I do want to mention is the rule book has an error in it where it talks about the contracts um, on your office board it has a player aid, one, two, three, and four, and it walks you through your turn. And the first part is investing, where you buy buildings and bonus cards. You cannot have more than five contracts on your board. So if you have acquired more than that, if you have six or seven contracts, when it comes to that investment, uh, the first part of your turn, the investment phase, you must sell down to five. You can never have more than five at the end of the investment phase. It's a mistake in the rule book. It says that you must sell some of the contracts. No, you have to sell them all until you get down to five. So that's that mistake. Then also, 
there is a card in the game called Ulster House, and we'll take a picture and put it on the screen. Um, but Lori has fixed this card because uh, it initially gave one point for every good left over in storage, and that's that's really crazy. That would be a lot of points. You can see I had a lot of them left over here at the end of the game. But uh, it was supposed to take, say, one point per type of good. And uh, it's the 14 value card. Uh, costs you 14 bucks to get it, or 14 failure. But uh, yeah, that's an, an error on there. Lori's fixed that. And she uh, also uh, found out about this uh, rule problem in the rule book. And uh, so you need to fix that also if you buy this game. The English translation had just got messed up. But uh, yeah. Want to make sure I point that out to you. And um, I was, I'm so pleased to finally have picked up a copy of Mercator. I had to tell you about it because you may know somebody that says, I hate that game. I bought it and I hate it. Tell them, you, you know, I'll give you five bucks for that. <laughs> Maybe you get lucky. But uh, it's a great game and um, I really love it. And for Uwe, it's like, you know, um, it's more in that Agricola Glass Road or at Labora kind of tight design. Um, you know, very, very, um, again, uh, a cerebral puzzle. And that's a lot of fun if you uh, are in the mood. And uh, sometimes you are, sometimes you aren't. But uh, if you like to, that kind of thing, burn your brain a little bit once in a while, Mercator will get that done for you. So I just wanted to tell you about it. And I think that's about all I wanted to say. I mean, it's not, again, not a lot of rules to this game. But um, it's a lot of fun to play. And I hope you guys get the chance to play it. I hope if you don't have it, I hope you get to pick it up. And um, thanks for watching. I'll see you again on the next Bones Collector. Make sure you like. Please subscribe. I love every one of you. And keep on board gaming because it's the best hobby on the planet. Bye-bye.